promises of God are altogether trustworthy, not so the promises of men, even those invited to give the annual more lectures. In my first lecture, I made a number of promises. In particular, I claimed that retrieving the Reformation solas was a way to counter the vociferousness that has dogged the Protestant commitment to sola scriptura. And here, I began to make good on my claim, hope to fulfill some of those promises by retrieving sola gratia, by grace alone. Just before we get started fulfilling promises, though, let me say a few words about my premises. I don't think I'm importing a foreign problem to Sydney, even if some of you might think it prudent to leave me for a few days in the Eastern Creek quarantine facility. <laughs> the sad truth is that in our global culture and our digitally shrunk wrap times, Sydney, Sydney churchgoers, even Sydney churchgoers, are probably affected by secularization, skepticism, and if not schism, the still disturbing phenomenon of, of people having doctrinal differences. I disagree with critics who blame such developments on the reformers. I believe the way forward is to reclaim or retrieve the priesthood of all believers, but only when we view it in light of the five solas taken together, taken as an organic whole. And I think Graham Goldsworthy is right to identify this organic whole with the Trinitarian gospel. So I'm following his lead in these lectures in relating the solas to the ontology, epistemology, and teleology of the gospel and connecting the latter, the teleology, with ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. Uh, my outline, which you have, and thanks again to Paula for preparing it so nicely. Uh, my outline, if you notice it, uh, follows a similar structure for each lecture. Four points, A, B, C, D. The A uh, reminds us what the reformers said on that particular sola. The B, <laughs> reminds us what they were reacting against and what we confront today, that is, alternative positions on these issues. C is the retrieval, the constructive appropriation for today. And then D tries to summarize things with, I think, four theses, uh, especially bringing what I've said in the retrieval to bear on the problem, this question of, the, who has the authority to interpret scripture and how do we sort out the different interpretations. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. If you were here Friday, you'll recall that retrieval is not repetition, but rather a way of looking back to the Reformation creatively in order to move forward faithfully. So we began by reviewing what the reformers wanted to recover by affirming sola gratia. Luther's aha moment came thanks to an exegetical about face in his understanding of Paul's phrase, the righteousness of God, in Romans 1.17. In his context, late medieval Catholicism, Luther understood it, as most people understood it, as a demand to make oneself acceptable to God by improving on the infused grace obtained by virtue of one's baptism and the other sacraments. What tormented him, however, was the dread that he had not done enough to improve upon the grace that he had. He hadn't done enough to make himself sufficiently righteous to be acceptable to God. What a terrible burden. Now, after wrestling with the biblical text in Romans for several days, the light finally dawned. He realized that God's righteousness was not a demand, but a donation. Luther reports that he felt as if he had gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of scripture looked different, took on new meaning. Because Luther had discovered the freedom of the Christian. He had discovered sola gratia. For Calvin, the aha moment was more gradual. <laughs> coming into greater focus over several editions of his institutes. You remember his famous opening statement about the mutuality of knowing God and knowing oneself. 
That statement appeared in every edition of the Institutes. Now, what interests Calvin is the saving knowledge of God. And that's what we have in Scripture, the good news that the Father sent his Son to make us who were by nature children of wrath his own children by adoption. So grace isn't the assistance to make us obedient children. It's the act of adopting us. We can't make ourselves children of God. So back to Calvin's idea, to know God is to know oneself, to know oneself is to know God. What Calvin discovered is that God is grace and that we must therefore be grateful. Uh, the his Reformation historian Brian Garrish argues in his book, Grace and Gratitude, that Calvin's theology of the Lord's Supper, though it comes at the end of the Institutes, is actually organically connected to the whole because everything in scripture and theology concerns the father's liberality and his children's answering gratitude. The holy banquet is simply the liturgical enactment of a theme of grace and gratitude that is at the heart of Calvin's entire theology. That's the way of summarizing the knowledge of God, grace, the knowledge of ourselves, gratitude. Calvin had grasped the freedom of God. He had recovered sola gratia. Now Luther, this is point two, Luther came to see that the Roman Catholic Church of his day had exchanged its birthright for a pot of lentil stew. The church had exchanged God-given grace for man-made religion, a jury-rigged system for appeasing the divine. This is actually an exchange of the truth for a lie, the oh-so-tempting idea that sin is something we can manage through our own ritualized practices, a fire that we can contain and control. But you see, grace contradicts every system of religion. It can't be predicted, calculated, or manipulated. And so grace is especially troublesome for control freaks. Sinners curved in on themselves, bent on making their own existence secure. To misunderstand the grace of God, that it's God alone who out of his own good pleasure gives us righteousness, to, under, to misunderstand that is to go wrong everywhere in theology. And that's the thrust of the 28 theses that comprise Luther's 1518 Heidelberg Disputation, where he contrasts the theology of glory and the theology of the cross. In Luther's work, the theologian of the glory, that's, that's, that's not the hero, that's the villain. So we have to get this right. The theologian of glory tries to know God by extrapolating from what we see, the visible world, to the invisible world of the creator. But it's all about rational inference, starting from the visible and then us reasoning up, as it were, to God and himself. And rational religion tells us that God will reward our moral striving. The theology of glory is what says God helps those who help themselves. But Luther takes his bearing from the cross of Christ alone. And the cross contradicts the idea that human freedom can satisfy the law by doing works. Here's thesis 16 from the Heidelberg Disputation. The person who believes that he can obtain grace by doing what is in him adds sin to sin so that he becomes doubly guilty. You see, the theology of glory errs in thinking that grace is simply the icing on the cake of human effort. The cross, as I say, is the refutation of all religion, the attempt to secure God's favor by doing things ourselves. Christianity is not a system for making oneself right before God. It has nothing to do with self-glorification. So the theology of glory is, is what we don't want in Luther's way of looking at it. On the contrary, we're prepared to receive the grace of Christ only when we despair of our ability. Now that's counterintuitive to a species that glories in its accomplishments. And we do, don't we? 
Did you know that there's a hall of fame for piano tuners in Kansas City? <laughs> so pride, this tendency to glorify in our own achievements, that's endemic to our fallen nature. So Luther was contextually situated, yes, but he was dealing with a problem that's hardly confined to his moment in space and time. There's no culture that is righteous, no, not one, nor is there a historical expiration date for the good news of grace alone. So we can retrieve sola gratia because what Luther discovered as true for him is true for all times and places. For by grace you have been saved by faith, Ephesians 2.8. So this is a necessary truth for genuinely Christian theology. And what's at stake here is our grasp of who God is, the reality of God what Luther calls the theologian of glory, extrapolates from nature to the existence and nature of God. That's natural theology. It uses a method we call the analogy of being. And those who use this approach look at things in creation, they identify God-like properties, and then they inflate them until they reach infinite proportion, at which point, they say God is all good, all powerful. He has all God-making properties. <clears throat> the problem with that is that's exactly what Ludwig Feuerbach, the 19th century grand master of suspicion, had in mind when he said that the secret of theology is anthropology, by which he meant that theology is really about us. It's about what we think is godlike. So the theology of glory, rational religion, is really about us. It's about what we think is ideal, what we would like God to be like. And I think Luther and Feuerbach agree at least on this. The theology of glory, man-made religion, is idolatrous. It's a human projection. And so it's oriented to nothing. It's an idea. And so Feuerbach calls religion a dream in which our own conceptions and emotions, our own feelings about what God is like, appear to us as separate existences. In other words, God is simply humanity writ large in the sky. That's why he says, Feuerbach says, anthropology is the secret of theology. So we don't want to go in the direction of the theology of glory. We don't want to invent the idea of God. And Luther contrasts in the starkest terms those who project their own ideas onto God with those who attend to God's self-projection in Christ. We don't have to invent God. God has projected himself into our history. So here's his thesis 21. A theology of glory calls evil good and good evil. In other words, they get it exactly the wrong way around. A theology of the cross, by contrast, calls the thing what it actually is. I love that idea. We can call a thing what it is only when we attend to what it is in Christ and his cross. So the Reformation is first and foremost a recovery of grace, not only that righteousness is the gift of God, but also that God makes himself known in Christ. And that's what the theology of the cross does. It sets forth in speech what is in Christ. And the Reformers clearly saw and said that what is in Christ is the grace of God towards sinful humanity. It's not an illusion, it's not wish fulfillment, it's fact, and the most important truth in the universe. This is what is. This is our God. So, the Reformation retrieval of grace, point three, was also a hermeneutical event, as well as a theological one, and one that led the Reformers to read Scripture for this Word of God. Because in order to be a theologian of the cross, says Luther, we have to tell the difference between law and gospel. 
This is tricky. Luther says that even the Gospels can be read as law if, for example, we think of Christ as an example of how we should live our life. Luther says if we look at Christ simply as an example, a moral exemplar as Kant looked at Christ, then we turn Christ into Moses. We mistake gospel for law. To ask what would Jesus do is not gospel. No, the gospel says that before you take Christ as an example, you accept and recognize him as a gift, as a present that God has given you and that is yours. Now, there's a way of reading the books of Moses and the rest of the Old Testament as gospel, that is, as promise concerning Christ. It's all about the gracious provision that God makes for Israel that would allow an unholy nation to live before him. But in any case, the ability rightly to, to distinguish between law and gospel is for Luther the highest art in Christendom. You have to know how to do that in order to read the scripture correctly. And there's another aspect to Luther's retrieval of grace that has to do uh, with how the gift of righteousness of God is communicated to us in language. Luther complains that the mass, uh, the Roman Catholic mass, obscures the gift of Christ because the gift of Christ is tied to the word, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And everything that counts is in those words. And those words constitute a testament. And a testament is a promise made by one about to die, in which he designates his bequest and appoints his heirs. The bequest in question is the forgiveness of sins. The heirs, those who believe the words and receive the gift. And Luther sees all the promises of God throughout Scripture as foreshadowing Jesus' last will and testament. Promise is the operative term, and it led Luther to understand the language of grace in a new way. When Jesus said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, he's not describing something that's already happened. He's making it happen as he speaks. His words of forgiveness constitute the reality of forgiveness. And the scribes listening to Jesus knew that because they said to themselves, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark 2.7. But the point is that Jesus, by speaking, is also doing something. And that he has the power and authority to do it which becomes clear when he commands the paralytic to walk, saying, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Now, the miracle gets the attention. The walking is sensational, but the forgiving of the sins is the greater speech act. The gospel, similarly, is a powerful word, a promise that constitutes a relationship a word that does what it says, like bless you or I do in the context of a wedding. So when Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, this is his I do to the disciples. Luther calls the gospel an efficacious word that does not simply talk about freedom, but it promises freedom and in promising actually frees us. Here's how the Lutheran theologian Oswald Bayer explains it. He says, the linguistic sign, the words, is already the matter itself. And this was Luther's great hermeneutical discovery, his reformational discovery. Christ is really present in his promise. In other words, Luther and the reformers more generally experienced grace verbally through the various ways in which the Bible presents Christ as God's gift. Okay, point B, and I'm curtailing this because this is more about other positions out there and I want to, st to stay as constructive as possible. But uh, as I mentioned in my first lecture, perhaps the most hurtful criticism of the Reformation is that it unintentionally begat secularization. 
And if true, that would be tragic because it would mean that the movement ultimately lost precisely what had, it had originally recovered, the grace of God. Because what is secularization if not desacralization or degracification of the world? But everything depends on what we mean by grace and how we think it relates to nature. So uh, under medieval scholasticism, I mentioned Thomas Aquinas, who said, grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. Uh, everything hinges on how we relate grace and nature. But uh, I think we can skip these other options. Let me just go on to C. The Roman Catholic view, though, that has made a comeback in La Nouvelle Théologie, a sacramental ontology, the idea that nature is open to grace because as created, we already participate in the divine nature. That Roman Catholic view generates a much more positive view even of fallen human nature. Grace supplements and perfects freedom as faith supplements and perfects reason. But the Reformation undoes that way of relating nature and grace, that sacramental tapestry. When the reformers say that grace does not simply perfect or complete nature, but transforms and restores it, regenerates it. It's not that simply grace tops it up. If grace simply tops it up, the suggestion is that we can do quite a bit because of our own nature on our own. Well, why am I talking about nature, ontology, the study of being, in a lecture that's supposed to be about grace? The reformers clearly were most interested in soteriology, salvation, not with questions about God's being, much less being in general. But this detour into ontology, and by the way, I'm still blaming Goldsworthy because he's the one that linked it. He's the one who first mentioned it in connection to grace. But it's necessary for a couple of reasons. First, to clarify the reformers' understanding of grace and thus absolve them from the charge of having unwittingly secularized the world. But then second, to clarify the nature and purpose of mere Protestant biblical interpretation. Uh, so Goldsworthy is the one who said, the principle of grace alone points us to the ontological priority of God. I think that's right. The principle of grace alone points us to the ontological priority of God. I'm going to argue that sola gratia has ontological as well as soteriological significance. In other words, it's going to help us understand the nature of God. And we need to get that right. And then second, I'm going to argue that by helping us to see that the Bible, biblical interpretation, and biblical uh, interpreters themselves refer not simply to what happens in nature, natural entities, natural processes, but rather the whole process of biblical interpretation, like the text itself, uh, are elements in an economy of grace. So grace is going to envelop everything. But we start then with ontology, communicative ontology, and the triune grounding of grace, trying to, trying to tease out what Goldsworthy meant with that statement. So how does the principle of grace point us to the ontological priority of God. Paul tells us that it is to the praise of God's glorious grace that he's chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. In Christ, through the Spirit, the saints get a share in God's own life. They become co-heirs with the Son to the Father's wealth, we read that in Ephesians 1.11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, a treasure made up of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What do we get? I'm curious. I'm sure it's better than my IRA, but, but what is it? Well, we get all the privileges of sonship. Everything the Father shares with the Son because we have the spirit of adoption. We become sons and daughters too. 
We get from grace to ontology because to explain what we have in Christ, we have to talk about the Trinity. Salvation comes from the Trinity, happens through the Trinity, and brings us home to the Trinity. Salvation comes from the Trinity. What we receive in Christ is the light, life, and love that characterizes God's own eternal life. There's no greater inheritance than the light, life, and love that characterizes God's own life. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in John, he says, You loved me before the foundation of the world. This is crucial because in contemporary theology, lots of theologians are saying that God needs the world in order to be love. But God did not need the world in order to have something to love. He was loving the Son before the foundation of the world. God is love, always has been, always will be. And that's ontological, saying what God is. The life God has in himself is perfect, and it's made up of lively personal relations. The father begetting and loving the son, the son's being begotten and being loved, and the spirits proceeding from the father and the son and being their bond of love. This is God's perfect life. And this is what is ground zero, as it were, for the missions of the Son and the Spirit, which Scripture tells us about, the sending of the Son and the Spirit in the history of salvation. The technical term for what's going on in God's own life is procession, and this, is, this processing of, of one person to the other is eternal, and it gets played out in history in the missions of the Son and the Spirit. In other words, God is lively in himself, and his life then gets expressed outwards through the Son and the Spirit so that we can have a share in it. So the Son enjoys the Father's love in eternity. The Son shares in the life of the Father. John 5, 26, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And then I think we can say that the Son shares in the Father's light. Uh, thinking of Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The Father and the Son share love, light, and life. Now, I don't want to speculate for too long about God as he is in himself. And yet... Scripture does say that God is light. It does say that God is love. And we know that these are what gets shared between Father, Son, and Spirit. Let's call the sharing of God's light, life, and love triune communication. Triune communication. This is the deep background of the gospel message that God has incorporated a people into his own life to have fellowship with. And it's all of grace. God was under no compulsion to create a world. God was fully God, fully actualized in his own being apart from us. And I stress this because we, we preserve the gratuity of grace only by affirming the perfection of God's own life. He didn't need to be gracious. Grace is gratuitous. I think this is what Goldsworthy has in mind when he says grace alone, alone points us to the ontological priority of God. Now, Scripture often talks about the grace of God, but never says God is grace, the way it says God is love and God is light. And that raises an interesting question. Is God gracious towards himself? God is all his perfections, but grace, perhaps like providence, has reference only to what is external to God. So what is grace? It's God's free communication of his own light, life, and love 
to those who left to themselves would have no share in them. Grace is free, and what God communicates or shares is himself. In being gracious, God is being fully himself, not in himself, but towards undeserving others. That's grace, God being himself towards undeserving others. And here's the ontological point, I think, why this matters. Grace is not some thing, some third thing between God and us that God has to infuse to us through the sacraments as if it were a substance that we needed to accumulate to make ourselves right before God. Grace is rather the gift of God's own presence and activity. It's the communication of God's own light, life, and love outwards towards the undeserving. All right, that's what I wanted to say about ontology. Let's move on to two, economy, the outworking of who God is and himself. And Ephesians 1.10 speaks of the plan, the oikonomia, for the fullness of time. What was predestined in Christ to the praise of God's grace was made known by the plan set forth in Christ, the oikonomia, the economy. Now, yesterday, when I was at St. Thomas's Church for worship, the program included a quote from Jim Packer, and it described the economy as, quote, God's single, huge, mind-blowing plan. That's the economy. And grace is what accounts for the life of God in itself being poured out towards us. So when we use the word oikonomia or economic, we have reference to the work of the Father, Son, and Spirit to execute in time a plan that was conceived in eternity. And the mystery of this plan, made known in Christ, is that God has planned to share his own life with those who are not God. Now, biblical theology focuses on the economy, the historical outworking of the plan of salvation uh, via the various covenants and so on. But the economy, in order to be truly gracious, is grounded in the life of the eternal God who did not have to give of himself. Elsewhere, I've tried to describe this with a dramatic analogy. I, I see the mighty acts of God in Scripture as theatrical representations of the perfections of God's nature in himself. Creation is the theater, not only of God's glory, but of his grace. So the missions of the Son and the Spirit are the acting out in the history of Jesus, of what's been going on in God's own life eternally, this communication of light and life and love that is the Trinity. And so, in the gospel, God is being himself, ontology, but he's enacting what, who he is and what he is towards us, undeserving others. Out of his sheer generosity, his unsearchable freedom and love, God shares everything he is with those who have no claim on him. So I hope you appreciate how the Trinity and what I'm calling a communicative ontology, a being that goes out of itself to share its life with what is not itself, is indeed the proper and necessary base of the gospel. But let's consider the economy, God's single mind-blowing plan, in a little more detail. According to Jonathan Edwards, the end for which God created the world was God's self-communication. God creates the world to share his own life with creatures, to share his knowledge and love and joy. And creation then is this theater for the appearance of grace in human history. That's why we're here. Why is there something rather than nothing? <laughs> so that God can show his grace. This grace takes the form of God's personal initiatives to human creatures. If I'm belaboring the point, it's to contrast what I'm calling a communicative ontology with a sacramental ontology. In a sacramental ontology, 
Creatures are related to God and grace simply by virtue of their existing. And that's what Luther was reacting against. Now, there's an element of truth to this. We are dependent on God as creatures each moment for our continued existence. But Scripture tells the story of God's making communicative initiatives, speaking to particular persons by means of the prophets and eventually by his son. And many of these communicative initi initiatives were covenants, solemn oaths that established a relationship and kinship between the Lord and a particular people. And the covenant of grace involves a king who rules, a people who are ruled, and a sphere where this rule is recognized as taking place. Hope you can see that I've done my biblical theological homework. <laughs> Let me put it this way. The economy of redemption, the outworking of the plan of salvation, reveals God's ontological perfections. That's why ontology is the basis of the gospel. We understand, or at least we begin to understand, who God is in eternity from what he does in time, because what he does in time reveals who he is in eternity. His covenant-making and covenant-keeping actions in particular reveal that God is faithful and true. God's love is his self-giving. His righteousness is his right-doing. His faithfulness is his word-keeping. And his grace is, I suggest, his face shining. His grace is his face shining. I think this phrase captures grace's dual nature, both as a disposition and activity. First, disposition. One of the most frequent Hebrew terms for grace, hen, connotes the favor that an inferior finds in the eyes of a superior. It's found frequently in the Old Testament in an idiom to find favor in the eyes of so-and-so. Uh, the Septuagint uses the Greek for grace, charis, to translate this. Uh, Numbers 625 brings out a second aspect of grace, the activity. Uh, the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The face represents God's presence. The shining, the graciousness of his presence. Psalm 80 corroborates the connection in its repeated line, let your face shine that we may be saved. God's presence is light giving. Moses' face was shining when he came down from Mount Sinai. The face of God not only shines but speaks. The Lord makes promises to Abraham and Moses and David. And this too is a kind of face shining. And these promises are also grace and have to do with chesed, the steadfast love of God. God was under no obligation to make his face shine upon the earth. Yes, after six days of creating, he pronounced it very good, and it's safe to infer that he must have smiled on Adam and Eve. But soon thereafter, there was little to smile about. Sin led Adam and Eve to hide from the presence of the Lord, Cain, after murdering his brother, laments, from your face I shall be hidden. And two verses later we read, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. And then we hear the chilling verdict two chapters later, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And even his treasured possession Israel and her kings did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is not a process of secularization, but insurrection. It's rebellion. Uh, sola gratia, though. God, nevertheless, freely sets in motion not only the creation, but also its redemption, communicating his goodness to those who don't deserve it. And Jesus is the gratuitous promise of God made flesh, the shining face of God up close and personal, full of grace, and truth. So, the Trinity is the ontological presupposition of the gospel of grace. Grace points us to the priority of God, the priority of his presence, activity, and his shining face. 
All right, point three. By grace you have been saved. We who were dead in our sins have been made alive, thank God. But to what end? Goldsworthy reminds us that the gospel is not simply about the forgiveness of sins. It's not simply about going to heaven when you die. It's about the restoration of relationships between God and humans and the world. Jonathan Edwards says that the great thing purchased for us by Christ is communion with God. We can link this to Bonhoeffer's idea that the church is God's new purpose for humanity. What these answers have in common is the idea of communion, the purpose of God's gracious communication of himself is communion. Communion is the supreme covenant blessing. I will be your God and you will be my people. What's interesting about that phrase is that each exists for the other. Communion. And communion is simply a sharing in union. God's grace establishes a unitive relationship. We know that the end of the economy as Ephesians 1.10 tells us, is to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Peter O'Brien identifies cosmic reconciliation and unity in Christ, things in heaven, and Christ creating a new humanity himself, Jew and Gentile, things on earth. This is the central message of Ephesians and the gospel. In Christ, there's a reconciliation of all things, there's one man in place of the two, one holy nation made up of what used to be two peoples, a, a people who now are the place where God rules and lives. All right, well, what does this all have to do with biblical interpretation? It's time to draw some morals now. Now, remember, retrieval's looking back in order to, to move forward, and I'm viewing the solas as resources, something we can draw on to resolve problems that we face today, a very present help in trouble, a resource. And in particular, we're looking back at what the reformers meant by sola gratia in order to respond to this problem that I flagged last time. People accuse the reformers of inadvertently bringing about secularization. Now, my plan is to address this charge in various stages. Uh, today, we're looking at the charge of secularization. Sola fide will focus on the principle of authority, sola scriptura on the pattern of authority in order to address the charge of skepticism. That also is what the Protestants were supposed to have inadvertently brought about. Solus Christus will focus on the royal priesthood of all believers, and that will address the charge of schism. And then finally, in the last lecture on Friday, Soli Dea Gloria will return to the scene of the crime, the beginning of fissiparousness, that is, a Protestant division over the Lord's Supper. And there we'll try to address the charge of hyperplurality and interpretive disagreement in the church. Again, I'm looking at the solas not as doctrines in their own right, but as theological insights into the ontology, epistemology, and teleology of the gospel. So I have uh, four theses here. The first one is, mere Protestant Christians agree that the many forms of biblical discourse together make up the story of God's gracious communicative initiatives. I hope you have caught that sola gratia puts the accent on God's gracious communicative initiatives, his free and loving acts of communicating his own light life, and love. This is crucial because Christianity is not a system of ideas. It's about what God has done in Christ. These acts of God span the Testaments. The one who brought Israel out of Egypt is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And so what we have in Scripture is a historical account, an economy of God's gracious communicative activity focused in Israel and Christ. So, mere Protestant Christians agree on this. We agree on the persons and events that make up the gospel story. We may disagree at points about just what precisely the story means, but the story meaning distinction, I think, is important. 
Because it's one thing to differ over this or that aspect of a story, something else altogether to differ about what the story is. That's a tricky distinction, but I hope it, we have fellowship with those who agree on what the story is, even if we may disagree about some of the details. The four evangelists tell the same story, and it's not that they disagree about the details, they have different interests in it. We may differ to some extent over the meaning and significance, but we shouldn't change the story. That's, of course, what the deceivers mentioned in 2 John did. When they refused to confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, 2 John 7, they changed the story. They changed the story. And that's what makes them deceivers. It became, the, the gospel in their minds became something other than the story of God's self-communication. And that short circuits the whole economy of grace. If systematic theology has a reason for being, if I can defend it as a discipline, it would be because it preserves the integrity of the biblical story by identifying who the story is about, by insisting, as they did at Nicaea, that the son is of the same substance as the father. If he were not, it would be a different story. So the rationale for systematic theology is that it preserves the integrity of the biblical story. Second thesis, mere Protestant Christians agree that the Bible is fundamentally about grace in Christ. That may sound trite, maybe even too easy, but we shouldn't underestimate its significance, especially in light of what we've just said about deceivers. It's no little thing to achieve interpretive consensus as to what a text is fundamentally about. Luther says, unless one understands the things under discussion, one cannot make sense of the words. That's another justification for systematic theology that I would give. Its, it's focus may not be on the words, we may not be as linguistically cool as exegetes, but our focus is on the things the words are about. And sola gratia is a permanent reminder that the story at the heart of Christian faith is good news. It's about God's going out of himself for our sake. A third thesis. Mere Protestant Christians believe that the Bible, the process of interpretation, and interpreters themselves are all part of the triune economy of grace. <clears throat> now this may be more significant than it appears at first glance. First of all, it tells us what the Bible is. The Bible is the living and active word of God. It's the means by which God communicates himself. It's not an inert matter. It's not a dead body on which to perform exegetical autopsies. But moreover, to rely on one's own native interpretive powers is to succumb to what I think I'll call a hermeneutics of glory. This expectation that one can discover the meaning of God's word simply through the exercise of one's natural abilities. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner parsing his Koine Greek phies. He came to Hapalus consulted Dan Wallace and said, what a scholar am I? <laughs> now it's true that in the academy, people tend to read the Bible like any other book, in the universities especially. And when they do that, they're involved in what we might call a this-worldly economy of criticism. It's all about natural capacities rather than the triune economy of grace. But if we're right about what the Bible is about, there is no pure state of nature that we can rely on to do anything. So it's that practice, by the way, reading the Bible like any other book with our own natural resources, is that practice, I submit, not mere Protestant Christianity that has secularized the biblical text and its interpretation. Mere Protestants acknowledge the Bible as what it is, as the result of a divine initiative and a means of continuing divine 
communicative action. In other words, the Bible is God's address. It's a living and active word. And we are its addressees. We're caught up in the story. There is no pure state of nature. John Piper asks why Paul begins his 13 letters with the phrase, grace to you, but then concludes his letters with the phrase, or a variation of the phrase, grace be with you. And he answers it's because Paul believes God's grace is actually being mediated to the readers by the words. In other words, the process of interpretation is from grace to grace. It's by grace alone that the word is spoken. It's by grace alone that the word is received. And it's by grace alone that the word dwells richly within us. So it's not contra Aquinas. It's not that grace perfects natural interpretive acts, but rather that it restores interpretive agents to right-mindedness and right-heartedness and reorients interpretation to its proper end, receiving Christ into our hearts and minds. So to recognize scripture as God's gracious address is to view biblical interpretation less as a procedure that readers perform on the text than a process of spiritual formation that the text performs on us. God uses the words of scripture as an instrument of his communicative presence and activity. The words become holy scripture because God takes them up and these words have their goal in the formation of a holy people through the process of listening and reading and contemplating and obeying these words. In other words, very simply, to read in the economy of grace is to let what the Bible is govern the way we approach it. To read in the economy of grace is to let what the Bible is, the living and active word of God, <clears throat> govern the way we approach it as interpreters. The Bible is the word of God. And upon reading it, we enter into holy ground the domain of the revelatory and redemptive presence of the risen and ascended Christ. So we have to give our full attention to what the Lord is saying to us in Scripture rather than trying to discover what we wish he had said. That's the hermeneutics of glory. In the economy of grace, mere Protestant Christians ought to be all ears. So, Mere Protestant interpreters are part of the economy of grace as members of the church. The church is the domain of Christ's risen presence. The church is the community where right habits of reading scripture are best formed and where the fruit of those habits is best exhibited. All right, last thesis that will sum things up, I hope. Mere Protestant Christians are interpreters who are themselves caught up in the triune economy of light and who therefore read the Bible as children of light. Now, everything I've said about the ontology, epistemology, and teleology of the gospel, all of which are implicit in grace alone, everything I've said could be restated in terms of light. This is a rich biblical theme, and I can only do it scant justice here. But ontology, I've said God is light. God dwells in unapproachable light. He's the source and creator of light. It's only in his light that we see light. That's epistemology. Jesus is the light of the world. The revelation of God, that's epistemology too, the means of knowledge. The Spirit shines the light of Christ into our hearts and minds, making us children of light, Ephesians 5.8. So I'm using light as an example to show how the economy of grace is an economy of light. We could have done this with life and love as well. 
But the whole economy of grace is an economy of light. The plan is all about how God is going to communicate his light to us to make us a people of light, a city of light, children of light, who will walk in the light. And it does that by focusing our attention on God's shining face in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So by economy of light, I mean the way that God administers his knowledge and understanding, the history of Revelation, and the way God delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of light, the history of redemption. The triune God is Lord of his lighting, and this Lord has been gracious because he hasn't kept his light to himself. He shared it with us. Light proceeds from the Father through the Son and attains its end in our hearts and minds by the Spirit. This is a Trinitarian communication of God's light. The Spirit's role is crucial. He's inspired the Scriptures. He convicts us that Scripture is God's Word. He opens hearts and minds so that we can see the light of Christ that is there. He is the illuminer. That's the traditional term, illumination. And this refers to all the ways in which our creaturely intelligence is preserved and directed by divine light. So the Spirit enables right hearing of God's communication, right reading. That's the simple way of putting it. The less simple way of putting it and here I'm using John Owen's terminology, (laughs) the Spirit, he says, is the principal efficient cause of our understanding God's mind as revealed in Scripture. He says, men may have a knowledge of words and the meaning of propositions in the Scripture who have no knowledge of the things themselves designated by those words until the Spirit brings that knowledge about. So the Spirit is the cause of the illumination, but Owen goes on to say that the Spirit's way of causing us to understand does involve our own mental faculties. So nothing I've said here means that you shouldn't do your homework. (laughs) But the point is you should do your homework with full awareness that you're in the economy of grace. Owen thinks then that the Spirit's way involves our mental uh, faculties and that the means of our coming to understand includes not only grammars and lexicons, but prayer, fellowship in the church. And I'll be coming to that, back to that in a later lecture. So to read in the economy of grace is to read with faces exposed to the face of God shining on us through the text. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I could have read that and we could have done something else for an hour, but that sums up much of what I want to say. There's a difference, says Jonathan Edwards, between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having a sense of its sweetness. And the Spirit's illumination communicates not just the sense, but the sweetness of the grace that is in Christ. And the light that emanates from the face of Christ shining in the scriptures should make our face shine as well. So the Spirit's role, and thus the goal in interpretation, is to allow the interpreter to understand the text in such a way that the text transforms the interpreter into the image of Christ. From light, through light, to light. The Spirit's illumination then communicates the gospel so thoroughly that what is in Christ begins to be in us as well. The word of God is a lamp shining in a dark place, 2 Peter 1.19. And Calvin's comment on this text is apt. 
He says, without the word, nothing is left for men but darkness. And the only reason we aren't in the dark is because God, in his grace, has spoken. Let there be light. And through the word he has spoken, we're being called out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2.9. So, mere Protestant Christians read scripture in the economy of grace in order to be drawn higher up and further in to that light. May the Spirit illumine us and open eyes to see and ears to hear the light of the world, the Word of God shining in the face of the biblical Jesus, dazzling us in the canonical fabric of the text. Amen. Thank you very much, Professor Van Hooser. We, we now have uh, time for questions. So uh, if you have a question, um, Professor Van Hooser will answer it. <laughs> have a go at answering it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thanks, for, uh, Van Hooser, for a wonderful lecture. And apologies for my question relates to things you've talked about already on Friday night. But I wonder if you could comment on whether there is, uh, as you see it, a necessary or canonical order um, in which we should discuss the five solas, and whether, uh, if that's the case, there's some inner logic uh, which dictates why the sole mediation of Christ comes so late in the sequence, um, and related to that, whether, if not, there might be some ways in which we could uh, gain benefits and uh, helpful safeguards in speaking <coughs> of grace and faith and scripture, having first spoken of uh, Christ and his soul mediation. Thank you for the question. I did ask myself it some time ago, and uh, I'm waiting to see how I'm going to answer it, because uh, I, let it, I let it resonate as a good question. I don't think there's a canonical ordering. One reason for that is, the five solos were never thought of the five at the time of the Reformation. So this would be a, a, you know, a post-Reformational canonical development, and who has the authority to do that? But I think it's a good question, and I did consider alternatives. Um, the sol but you're assuming what I'm going to do with Solus Christus, and so I'm going to do something different with it, and because of what I'm doing with it, I think it does belong where it is, it's because it's going to be about ecclesiology. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that um, I think, is probably the most counterintuitive um, interpretation of the solas of my five. Maybe maybe the fifth one will be a bit surprising as well. But that's surprising, right? Because you would have thought, well, isn't it about Christ? Well, it is about Christ, but I, I do, I'm going to be looking at the theme of the royal priesthood of the church. I started with grace because I wanted to start with ontology. And again, um, Goldsworthy is partly to blame because I'm following his suggestion that grace implies the ontological priority of God. And I think that's right, and certainly wouldn't want to start with faith. I mean, there's some I can rule out. I mean, I can make a good case for beginning with Sola Scriptura, because in many of the Reformed confessions, they either began with the doctrine of God, which is what I think I've done, or they began with the doctrine of Scripture. And there's good reasons for that. And in fact, the, um, the fact that the Reformers can't make up their mind where to begin, God or Scripture, that's actually what I call the problem of first theology. And in a sense, it's a good problem. The two always belong together. And so long as you show that, then I think it's okay wherever you start. It's just so long as you say they belong together. Because we can't talk about God for very long without talking about Scripture. And there's no reason to talk about Scripture unless we want to relate it to God. So they really do belong together. But... Uh, I started with grace in order to talk about who God is in himself. And it seems to me you can't go deeper than the imminent perfection of the triune God. So, but if you have an alternative canonical ordering to suggest, I'd be interested to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
quick question. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Uh, just wondering if you could comment on um, that grace that is not extended to the non-elect, and what does it tell us about who God is, and does it affect the sola gratia principle of biblical interpretation? Right. Uh, it's a very good question, because if God is merciful, does that mean he has to show mercy to every person who exists? Um, I think the key to remember in discussions like this is uh, another doctrine, the simplicity of God, which simply means that God isn't a collection of his perfections. He is a single perfect being. And what, the reason that's important is we should never play one attribute of God off against another. I think the Westminster Confession gets this right. You know, it, he is infinite, you know, uh, perfect, and so on, in his, and then they list things like holiness, justice, wisdom, mercy. I think that's right. And so if you, if you simply focus on grace and, and you have tunnel vision on grace, you may well raise the question, how can God be God if he isn't gracious to everyone who lives? He, doesn't he owe each individual salvation? But again, that is to forget the other attributes. God is free. God is holy. God is wise. I do not have an answer as to why God elects some and not others. What I know is he has predestined us in Christ, the saints. And I, there's no boundary on that. We know that he's no respecter of persons. He's burst all sorts of social boundaries. So there's no limits on his grace. I just don't want to presume upon his grace. Uh, the one theologian in the 20th century who had a kind of tunnel vision on this point is Karl Barth. And, um, you know, he tended towards universalism. He never would come right out and say it because that would be to presume upon God's freedom. But there is a logic in his position that pushes him that way. So it's a very good question. It's a mystery. Uh, you know, I can't speak for the eminent, uh, perfect God, but I, I do want to at least say that we shouldn't uh, fixate on one attribute and forget that God is all his perfections at once. And they don't, it's not as though there's a war. There, there, is, there are all ways of trying to get at the uh, marvel that God is that really does surpass human understanding. Uh, that's the best I think I can do. Mike Paget from St. Barnabas Broadway. Um, uh, we minister in the Harlem City in a very educated area, a very secular area. I've been thinking for some time of inviting local academics and writers and so on to join me in a course uh, on reading the Bible as literature. I'm wondering now in light of this lecture whether that's actually possible or a self-contradiction. Could you give a reflection on mm -hmm. what one might be doing when one invites an, an unbeliever to read the Bible as a as a document, as opposed to a yeah. dynamic, lively, gracious self-communication of the God himself? Yeah, great question. And uh, interestingly enough, that's happening in many universities. The courses in Bible as literature are cropping up in secular universities. Um, so C.S. Lewis wrote a lot about this as well because he was involved in translation work. and. Um, and because he was a literary critic and a writer himself, he thought a lot about this. And I think I agree with some of the things he says. If we read the Bible only as literature, we aren't doing full justice to it. And the first rule of interpretation, I think, is that you have to recognize what it is you're, you're dealing with. So Lewis um, says that the literary genre is important. And I certainly would want my students to have literary skills because Lewis says, it makes a difference uh, to f know that you're working with, that you have a, a cathedral before you or a corkscrew. You know, what kind of a thing is it? That's genre. And similarly, in the Bible, it makes a difference that you've got wisdom over here and apocalyptic and narrative. So I do think literary skill is very important. 
Um, my fear about reading the Bible as literature is that you're inviting people to bring a host of criticisms and theories to it. And that's more like the patient on the table that's completely helpless. I have a pet theory, and if someone can refute it, that would be great, but my theory is there is no school of literary criticism, no type of literary theory that someone hasn't applied to scripture. And it's fascinating, actually, how these things go in waves uh, because literary criticism and theory is quite a rapidly developing field. And there, and what, but often what you have is, uh, say, in an English department, you have people reading the text with certain ideological interests. So I love the idea of the Bible as literature, and it, for evangelistic purposes, it could work. Uh, I'm just reflecting on, you know, if it really is academics, they may try to bring their own ideological approach to it. And that's, that is the problem, you know, whose approach to scripture is the right one. And, and that's why I tried to head it off at the pass and say, no, the first thing we have to do is approach the text according to what it is. In other words, let the ontology of the text dictate what approaches we bring to it. If you bring approaches that don't really uh, respond to what the Bible is, I think you eventually fall prey to what Umberto Eco calls overstanding which is when you bring your agenda to the text and force the text to address issues that it really isn't interested in. Last point about the literature then. I think that if we let or try to read the text according to its own interests, we have to say the text has theological interests. If you try to read the Bible and hold that theological interest to one side, and by the way, many biblical scholars do this, you, know, you can read the Old Testament as political literature, you know, propaganda, you can read it as myth. A lot of people hold the theological interest to one side. But if a literary person or if a literary approach could be persuaded to let the interests of the text control the reading, then I think it could work but, because you'd have to read it theologically. Yeah, question in the middle, just wait for the microphone. So you, you skipped over the nature and or grace section somewhat. Yes. Would you be happy to take a few minutes to <coughs> sure. expand on a little? Uh, that, yeah, I was going to say that if we had extra time, I could fill in some of the blanks. Please. <laughs> Which one did you, were you particularly interested in? Uh, your choice, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I did give you the key quote from Aquinas, that uh, grace perfects nature. Uh, interestingly enough, Cajetan, in about the same period, introduced the idea of a pure state of nature. And I think that idea, rather than anything the reformers said, is probably what encouraged a kind of secularization. The, 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 because that's what secularism is. It's the idea that nature is autonomous. I don't find that in the reformers. But I, I, do th I did find it in Cajetan. So I think that, that was uh, interesting. And then the other thing about um, the Vatican II and the Nouvelle Théologie is that there is a newfound interest in trying to see all of reality as sacramental, as already participating in God. And I'm, I'm glad you raised the point because one of the reasons I emphasized communicative ontology is over, over against sacramental ontology is that I think that the sacramental idea is, sets people up to a kind of natural theological uh, approach. That is, everything that exists already is, by its nature, participating in God. I think scripture is interested in a very different kind of participation. It's interested in covenantal participation. And you don't have covenants simply there uh, because we're created. No, covenants have to be instituted. They have to be established. How are they established? God speaks them into being. God institutes them. And that's what I mean by communicative ontology. I, I want to, I think the nature grace is better discussed in terms of a communicative ontology. 
rather than the sacramental ontology, which assumes that we're already, by nature, plugged into God in some way. So it has to do with different theories of participation. And um, I didn't develop it as much as I should, but I'm concerned that even some Protestants are, are intrigued by or even drifting towards a sacramental ontology approach. I could name names, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just take one more, if there is one more. There's one over, one over here, Andrew. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. A bit of a practical question <laughs> yes. about that tension between kind of doing your homework and praying, uh, mm, mm. relying on the spirit. Mm. Uh, how does that play out when we're having disagreements with people? Have particularly people who don't kind of value, um, you know, deep reading or, or understanding of the original languages or uh, it, it's quite easy with reason to critique them, uh, whereas they could probably critique us on not praying and relying on the spirit as much mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. at times. Yeah, can you maybe comment on how to approach that sort of situation? Yeah, again, good question. Uh, I think I think subsequent lectures will address it to some extent when we talk about why we need a church for, for reading. But I think the first thing to say would be to affirm each side in what they're doing and encourage them to do a little better in what they're not doing. I mean, there's, I don't see this as an either or, and I don't think John Owen saw it as an either or either. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, do sen I do understand the dynamics. There are... Um, Feelings of insecurity, perhaps, that can feed into that, that make it more acute. But I think the reformers were very concerned to raise the bar of biblical literacy in the church. They were all for education. So it didn't mean we have to become academics. So I think the key for me would be to encourage people to see the value of education without being professional academics. But the reformers were very concerned to translate the Bible into the vernacular language so that people could read it for themselves. And they didn't want to just give them the Bible and send them away. No, they were catechized. They went through catechism. They were given tools and a framework to make sense of things. And again, I think Protestants have a vested interest in trying to raise the bar of biblical literacy. And that doesn't necessarily mean academics. It doesn't mean getting a degree. It means learning how to read the Bible. And that's something that I think we, you, you could make a biblical case for that. And prayer, while important, isn't a substitute for that. Uh, word and spirit always go together. If you have word without spirit, you're in trouble. If you have spirit without word, you're in trouble. So it's really a vision as to what uh, growth in the Christian life looks like. We need both word and spirit. Thank you very much. Please join me again in thanking Professor Van Hitler.